Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals. And on today's video, we're going to take a deep dive into pyrochemistry and smelt down some of these gold concentrates. Well, here's a nice close up look at these sulfides. These are gold concentrates off our shaker table. And they're primarily pyrite. And I think the gold is locked up within the pyrite crystals. And so no matter how fine you grind them, it's very, very small gold and it needs to be smelted to release the gold. And we're gonna get into the nitty gritty details on this about what kind of flux I use, why I use certain flux ingredients and what they do. And we're gonna test the concentrates. I'm gonna get these assayed and then we're gonna test the slag after we're done to see how much gold we lost. And then we can get a real nice percent recovery from our smelting experiments. The first thing we need to do is take a sample of these. And there is a kind of a correct way to do that. And what I've read in the old books is you mix it like this, where you take a, a sheet and you just fold it in on itself kind of over and over and over again. And this is how you thoroughly mix up the sample so we can get a representative sample. The idea is to get the true value of what's in here and not skew it in any way. So for example, if, if I was doing something like shaking this all in a pan, all the gold would go to the bottom. And if I just took a sample off the top, then I would, it would skew it as less gold than is actually in the sample. And so this folding technique is supposedly the best way to mix this. So I've got it pretty well folded up, mixed up. Now you can, talks about quartering it in the books. So you quarter it. And then I will take a sample out of this pile here and this pile here and send those off for assay. I will combine the rest of this back together and that's what we'll use for our smelting material. Okay, I'm gonna call this sample heads number one and I'm gonna take all the way down to the bottom, grab some of this material, try and get it all the way through the pile. And that will be our first assay. I'm gonna do the same thing over here with this pile on heads number two. Now these two are gonna tell us how much gold and silver we have in the material before it's assayed. And that is gonna be kind of our baseline for how much gold we can recover and how much gold we lose in our slag, then we can figure out what our percent recovery was. Now what I actually wanna to test today is the addition of a collector metal. In the past I've used lead, this is bismuth. And I wanna know how much collector metal we actually need to recover 99% of our precious metals. I did a test a couple weeks ago where I resmelted down some of my tailings and I didn't get any metal collected at the bottom of the cone. And so I, I should have added collector metal, but I don't know how much to add. And that's what I wanna to test today. All right, so we're gonna get down into the real nitty gritty here. And I'm gonna run a series of experiments today, but they're all gonna have the same basic flux recipe, okay? So I wanna go through this first, and then I'm gonna talk about the details of how I'm gonna change it and what I'm gonna test. So every sample is gonna have 100 grams of concentrates, which is approximately one mole of 50% iron sulfide FES and 50% FES2. I'm not quite sure which compound is in there, so that's kind of a good representation or good estimate. So that's what I'm gonna use for the composition of the sample. So the main component of the flux recipe is gonna be 100 grams of sodium hydroxide, also known as lye, and there's 2.5 moles of that. In the past, I've used sodium carbonate. I've switched over to lye, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later about why I made the switch. But for this experiment, that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna add 20 grams of SiO2, which is silicon dioxide, which is quartz. There's about a third of a mole of that. 20 grams of borax, which is about a tenth of a mole, 25 grams of potassium nitrate. We're gonna use this as an oxidizer. There's a quarter of a mole here, but what this does when it gets hot is it releases a bunch of oxygen, which will help oxidize some of these iron sulfides we have up here. 
Once all of this material is up to temperature in the furnace, comes to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit or about 1,100 degrees Celsius, I'm going to add 50 grams of iron in the form of nails. And once I add the nails, I'm going to smelt it for about 10 minutes after the iron addition to let the iron nails react with any leftover iron sulfide or FES2. And what that is going to do is the iron, you've essentially flooded the system with iron. This is what we want. We want FES because FES is soluble in our basic slag, which we make up here. And when the vein or the, the fluid system was in place, in this situation, there was more sulfur there than there is iron. And what we need to do is we need to add more iron to push all of this over to this FES. And when we get it all to FES, it's soluble in our slag. If we leave it as this, you'll get a, a matte phase, and the matte phase is notorious for holding some of our precious metals. So that's why we add the iron in. And once we add the iron in, it's going to take a little bit of time for the iron to react with this FES2 to pull those extra sulfur ions onto the iron metal and create 100% FES. And so we're going to keep our flux and our cons all the same, and we're going to be testing how much material in the form of collector metal we need to recover all of our gold and silver from our smelts. The reason why I'm switching to bismuth is lead is pretty toxic, as we all know, and bismuth is, is really not. It's pretty benign. You actually drink it when you ingest Pepto-Bismol, and so bismuth is a safer metal. It's less harmful to the environment, and it has almost the same properties as lead. It has a very similar melting point. It, the oxides form a liquid at about the same temperature so we can cupel the bismuth away just like we do the lead and leave the precious metals. So I'm going to switch to bismuth and we're going to start using bismuth from now on in our experiments. So now we're going to get way down into the weeds and talk about the sodium hydroxide versus sodium carbonate. I've used both of these in the past. And I've done tests now to hopefully confirm that they both are equally good as a flux and you don't lose more precious metals with one or the other. Now, they both end up being the same thing when you heat them. And let's go through that. So you have the sodium hydroxide plus heat goes to sodium oxide, which is what we want, plus water. Now, the sodium oxide is what we want because that will help dissolve our FES that we uh, make from our concentrates. So you really want that sodium oxide, and it is produced in both of these reactions. The byproducts are a little bit different. But the important part here, and the reason why I like sodium hydroxide, is it melts at a much lower temperature. So this H2O is released before it gets super, super hot and it prevents boil over. Also, you need less sodium hydroxide to create the same amount of sodium oxide compared to the sodium carbonate. You would need to add, I don't know, I'm, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it's about a third more, I think, because the carbon and the extra oxygen weigh a lot more than the hydrogen does. And so I can get away with adding less of the sodium hydroxide end up with the same amount of sodium oxide and I don't have to fill up my crucible with a bunch of extra flux and it boils, it doesn't boil nearly as bad as the sodium carbonate here. So that's why I'm using lye and this is really what we're after is sodium oxide. That's what we want. This is really, really expensive to buy if you're looking just for sodium oxide, it's much, much easier to just add sodium hydroxide to your crucible, add some heat, and end up with molten sodium oxide in your flux. All right, I want to walk through mixing up the flux one time for you guys to see how this works. So I'm going to add our 100 grams of concentrates. This is where all of our precious metals are going to be. There's our 100 grams. This is our sodium hydroxide. We're going to add 100 grams of this. 
I should also mention the sodium hydroxide and the borax are both really good at absorbing water from the atmosphere. And the borax I'm using is anhydrous, so there's no water in it. If you go to the store and you buy it at the grocery store, you're going to get borax with some water in it. So you got to keep them in sealed containers. This is really, really caustic. It's really basic stuff. You don't want to get it on your skin and you really don't want to get it in your eyes. It'll blind you real quick. So you got to, you got to have, you know, your proper PPE on when you're handling this stuff. I'm going to add our 100 grams of sodium hydroxide. Now we'll do 20 grams of silica sand. I add the silica for a couple different reasons. It's a great flux for oxides. It's very acidic. It makes it very glassy. And if you noticed when I was showing you the concentrates, they're rusty, right? They've oxidized some. So we need a flux in here that's good at absorbing oxides. Also what silica does is if you're using fire clay crucibles, it protects the fire clay crucible from the lye, the sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide, the, when it gets heated up, it really wants to grab onto silica and it'll pull it out of the crucible and it will essentially dissolve your crucible from the inside out. And so that's another reason why I add a little bit of silica as it allows for the, the sodium hydroxide to attack the silica sand in our flux rather than the crucible and it allows your crucibles to last a lot longer. Here's our anhydrous borax. This also is great at absorbing oxides and it will help reduce the melting temperature of the silica. If I just added a bunch of silica in a crucible and melted it, it would not melt at the temperatures we're gonna reach. So the borax helps, absorbs oxides, reduces the melting point of silica, and also keeps the charge fluid when we pour it. So that's why we add borax. Here's our potassium nitrate beads. And again, this is gonna act as our oxidizer. So when I heat it up, it's gonna release a whole bunch of oxygen. And the oxygen is gonna react with the FES, turn it into FeO, or some, some form of iron oxide. And it will also drive off the sulfur as uh, some sulfur compound. And so it will help re relieve some of that sulfur from our flux. So now we have our basic flux recipe, right? This is what we're gonna do every time, every experiment. I'm gonna put this in a crucible, and when it's molten, I'm gonna add nails. For this first smelt, I'm not gonna add any collector metal. We're just gonna smelt it as is, and it's gonna kinda of be a test run to see if we can completely decompose all the sulfides. If we can't, I'll adjust the flux recipe a little bit. But also, is there enough metal in here to act as a collector metal itself and collect down at the bottom of our cone mold? Here's our fire clay crucible. Here is our mixed up flux. Comes up a little less than halfway. You don't want to get it right up to the top because as this stuff melts, it does froth and boil and foam a little bit. And if you have it too full, it'll, it'll come over. I, I could use a smaller crucible or I could get it up to about two thirds. But for this experiment, we're gonna go with this. So now I'll go put it in my furnace and we'll talk about the furnace just a little bit and I'll show you the cone mold that we're gonna pour it into. Here's our furnace. It's just KO wool wrapped in a cylinder. I've covered the bottom in Portland cement, just in case there's any spills, it's easier to clean up. And now we'll fire up our propane furnace, put the lid on, and we'll smelt it. Once it comes up to temperature, I'm gonna pour it into this cone mold here. The metal, any metal that's in there, is gonna go right down to the bottom of the pyramid, and all the slag will float on top as a molten slag, and then as it cools, we can pull it out of the cone mold, break off the metal tip of the cone, and recover our precious metals.
While we're waiting for our test smelt to cool, I'm going to melt some of this bismuth. I need about 200 grams, 250 grams, that should be plenty. I'm gonna melt this just in a crucible in the furnace. I'm gonna pour it into water to cornflake it and to get a high surface area, small pieces that are gonna act as our collector metal. And then I can add various amounts of collector metal to our future smelts to test how much I need for a good recovery of our gold and silver. Well, I'm gonna try and get this bismuth down in that hot crucible down there. Let's see how this goes. There we go. That's already melting. There you go. That's gonna melt quick. Here's our water bucket. You probably don't wanna use a plastic bucket, but I wasn't prepared and this is what we got. And then I got a board in here and I'm gonna pour my molten metal right under the water surface and hit that board. And that board will make the metal splat essentially, hopefully while it's still molten and it'll increase the surface area and none should stick to the board hopefully. So let's see what happens. Whoa. Well, that was kind of exciting. What do we got here? Yeah, there's a ton of surface area there. It's spread out like crazy. Well, let me get it drained and dried and I might be able to even crush it up and use it as our collector metal. Well, there we go, crushed up bismuth. That worked pretty darn good. Huge amount of surface area. I just took a little hammer and just tapped on it and pretty much all fell apart. So now we've got a bunch of collector metal and once we get our test smelt cooled down, we'll see if we have any mat. If we don't have any mat phase, then we'll continue and start adding small amounts of bismuth to our smelts. Okay, moment of truth. I screwed up and I accidentally dumped the nails into the cone mold. That's really not what you want to do, but we can break them out of there. But I don't know if you can see, I had to add two more nails because they got eaten so badly by all those sulfides in there. So there was a significant amount of extra sulfur in there that was eaten away at that iron. Yeah, there's nails in there. So here's our slag. I can get it focused for you. It's pretty good looking. It's that stony look, which is characteristic of a basic slag. There's, this is gonna be a little bit deceiving, but right here is the tip of a nail and another tip of a nail, but there's no mat down there. A mat looks like, um, like a sulfide. That slag looks the same all the way down there. The mat looks a lot more crystalline. It'll have these crystals in it. So I'm real happy with that. That's a pretty good looking slag. I can smell the sulfur in it. It's, it smells really sulfury still. But let's see, there's the slag. If there's, if there's any metal at all, it'll be down in the little tip of this cone here. Let's see if we got any metal. So I don't see any precious metals at all. I think we're home free. I wanted to show you, I hammered those nails out of that slag and you can see how they just get eaten up to nothing. And there's one that's like a little needle, same there. The heads just get eaten down to nothing. This is the only full-size nail that was left. You can see right where it went into the slag, it got eaten up almost down to nothing. And I've edited the formula a little bit. I did 120 grams of lye. I did 30 grams of silica, and I did 30 grams of borax and I took out all of the oxidizer because it tended to boil over. 
All right, so here's gonna be our final recipe that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use 100 grams of the sulfide sample. I'm gonna use 120 grams of lye, 30 grams of silica sand, 30 grams of borax and iron nails. And then I'm gonna weigh each of the slags here. So our first one, no collector metal slag, weighs 285 grams. And I used zero G for zero grams of collector metal with the lye as our flux. So there's our first sample. Let's crank out the rest. Okay, wow, I've been smelting for a long time here, but I got it finished up and now I wanna go over kind of the results with you. The first thing that I noticed, and I think I got some shots of this, is the bismuth is a real crystalline metal when it cools. And sometimes that makes it hard to separate from the slag. So you get little chips off the, the metal collector that ends up attached to the slag, which is, is not good. You really don't want that. Lead, because it's super soft, it's uh, it, it really easy to separate from the slag, but the bismuth is a little bit trickier. To go over our recipe, it's up here again. This is the, I use the same recipe for all of these smelts. And I'm not gonna go over all of them, but here's the grams of collector. Here I used 25 grams and 50 grams as a lump, just a, a chunk of bismuth in the bottom. And then on these two smelts down here, I used soda ash instead of sodium hydroxide. And we'll go over that here in just a second. This is the weight of all the slags once the button was removed. And I do, I'm just shocked about the variation in the amount of slag that we got. I, I have no explanation for that. We, we got 360 grams on one of the lumps and we got as low as 238 on one of the collectors. So I, I do not know why the slags are, have such a high variation. This is the weight of the collector metal bead, the button. So on the 10 gram collector, I got 11 grams worth of button. On the 25 gram, I got 23 grams and so on down the line here. And then these numbers here are the numbers I used for the assay results. Also, interestingly enough, most of the sodium hydroxide samples, even with the lumps, are almost exactly the same amount for collector metals what I put in with a, you know a couple grams loss sometimes a gain every once in a while that's probably like I said you're getting little pieces chipped off in the slag but when I added the soda I started with 25 grams and it went down to 18 now I may have lost some with the boiling there but once I changed the recipe and made it so it doesn't boil I still lost a significant amount, more than 10%, 12%, somewhere in there. This one I lost 20% or so, maybe more. Um, so it's interesting to note that, this, that the sodium hydroxide has the best recovery of the collector metal, whereas the soda ash, you actually end up losing some, I don't know, through oxidation or there's something that happens in the crucible with that soda ash where you're gonna lose a little bit of collector metal. So it'll be interesting to see what the assays of these two come back with knowing that we have some collector metal in the slag somewhere, maybe tied up with some sulfide somewhere. Now, because I had a little extra time and I'm doing this, I thought I might adjust a little bit. And so going back to these soda ash ones, I tried a couple different soda ash experiments. The 160 grams of soda ash should give us the same amount of sodium oxide as uh, the, the recipe I used up here. But the problem was, is this ended up boiling. So this one up here, I used 25 grams of collector and it boiled. So it, it didn't, that's not a good recipe to use. I think there's too much soda ash there. So that didn't work very well. Then I did another one with 50 grams of collector. I used 100 grams of soda ash, 
20 grams of silica sand and nails. I removed the borax and that one did pretty good. Good, no boiling. It foamed maybe just a little bit at the beginning of the smelt, but it quieted down real nice. And then I did another one here. Since that one did so well, I tried to match it with sodium hydroxide. Again, this will end up with about 62 roughly grams of sodium oxide and 80 grams will end up with roughly 62 grams of sodium oxide. So since that one went so well, I tried to match it with the sodium hydroxide, 20 grams of silica, and it was like the perfect smelt. It was quiet, uh, it didn't boil, it didn't froth, it didn't gain volume in any way at all. So that is like the perfect smelt. I ran out of bismuth on that one, so I only had 18 grams of collector, but what I ended up with is, or I'm sorry, I had 19 grams of collector metal. I ended up with 18 grams of metal and 228 grams of slag. So I sent this one off for assay. We'll get this one. This one is numbered 20 GCL over here. So then I did four more smelts. I tried back to the sodium hydroxide and silica sand, added a little bit more to match the sample. Tried adding some potassium nitrate. A little foam at first, but otherwise it was pretty good. It was a good smelt. So if you want to add a little bit of oxidizer, that would be a recipe to do that. Then I got curious and I thought, well, what happens if I added 100 grams of sample and just 20 grams of borax, which is real acidic slag, and some collector metal, and we didn't try and dissolve the mat, and we didn't try and make this perfect smelt with this, you can get essentially the absolute maximum amount in a crucible without having all the extra flux. I ended up getting a huge mat layer here and I'll show you, this is all bagged up ready for assay, but there's the mat layer right there. And I'm glad I got one so I could show you guys. It, it kind of turns blue, it's, it's crystalline, it's, I don't know how to describe it, but that's what they look like typically. And sometimes they're real shiny but they're that crystalline mat. It looks like a massive sulfide and then a little bit of slag on top. But if this works, and maybe we lose a little bit of precious metals to the mat, but if you can do, if you can get 96% recovery instead of 99% recovery, then you can add three times what you could normally to a crucible and you don't have to do it all three times and waste all the fuel and all the time and all the stuff. So this is this is going to be an interesting one where it's just essentially a, a very poor smelt, but maybe having a small amount of loss is okay if you can cram three times in as much and get a decent recovery. And look at this. This button separated super, super nice from the slag. It didn't break up. It's all It's all nice and contained there in the metal button. Then I did a couple more down here. None really worked. I, I tried to flood the whole system with potassium nitrate and it just, it just frothed and foamed and boiled all over the place. And then I reduced it down to 50 and the same thing, it just boiled too much. So you really gotta be careful on how much oxidizer you add. But in a nutshell, that is the results from all of our different smelting tests. Okay, so our next step is I gotta get all this stuff off to the assayer and get it professionally assayed so we can figure out our percent recovery. And then I'm gonna take all those beads that we got and I'm gonna put them in the cupel furnace and I'm gonna refine them down to just the precious metal, just the gold and silver. Unfortunately, I have to wait maybe three or four weeks before I get the results back from the assayer. So this is gonna be part one of part of two part series on this whole smelting, we'll call it smelting class 101. So that's, I gotta wrap it up here guys. I'm sorry, I hate to do that to you. But stay tuned, be sure you subscribe if you wanna see part two, and that should be coming out in the next maybe three, four weeks. Again, I gotta wait on the assay results before I can do any more. So stay tuned for that one. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.